God was dealing with me last night. I, I, I went to my room, and I normally do this on, on Saturdays, and I already have a message that God has given me, and it's been in my head all week, and I've had the chance to kind of chew it over, and pulling a message together takes like 15 minutes for me because I've had it in my mind all week. And I get to my room yesterday, and I said, Lord, I have nothing, so I'm going to sleep. And I went to sleep. Now, I know for a pastor, you're like, oh, why would you do that? You know, it's not my job to bring you a message. That's God's job. I had to learn to rest in the Lord. So I went to sleep, and 1030, I woke up, and man, God gave me a message. And I began to think of the Ark of the Covenant. And I started asking some questions that I'm sure some of you probably have asked before, like, why would God ask them to put a, make a box so he can have the presence of himself there? See, we like putting God in box. We all want to, hey, this is God, and this is how God works. So I went, went right back into the word to make sure that God never got in that box. Because God told Moses, build this ark, and you'll come and I will speak to you there. And God told Moses what to put in the box. Put the two tablets of the commandments. Put that rod that budded. Put that little what is that in there. You know there's something that's called what is that in the Bible. You know there's another Bible that call it what you call it. That's what the word manna is. What is it? So if you're ever wondering it's, if God ever gives you something that you don't know what to call it, uh, yes, for 40 years someone got something, and some ones, three million of them, got something that they never knew what to call it, so they call it what you call it. And it's manna. And Moses would go to the ark, and God would meet him there. Now the presence of God was felt, and it was acknowledged by a box, but God never wanted to be in a box because I have read through scripture when it says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof I've heard that the earth is his footstool you ever put your foot on something you know sat down and put your foot up that's the earth for God so we can't fit him in a box so I started thinking of why we have the box because every church that I have gone to has decided they want to make a box. And they've called it by different things. They say, this is the vision of the house. You ever gone to someone that has a vision of the house? I'm 44 years old. I don't have a vision for me. So how do I have a vision for the house? You know, every year I'm getting older and things are changing. I don't have a vision for me. I don't know where I'm going. I'm going wherever God wants me to have. So why do I have a box for the church? If it's alive, shouldn't it be growing? I've learned certain things about certain animals like the turtle. The turtle carries his home on his back. But do you know how that turtle shell expands? It sheds. The outer covering of the shell sheds because the new shell is pushing out. See, even if we wanted to put God in a box, he'll be pushing from the inside out. For all of those that have put God in a box, he's pushing out. He's pushing out because he never intended to have himself in a box says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Look how many we have. Cannot even be contained in one of us. <laughs> it has to be disseminated on several. And that's still not enough to contain God. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. I read through this and I was so kind of uh, disheveled after reading certain verses. I went to the Message Bible, 
Every once in a while, one thinks to be a little simpler, so I know what they've told me, that uh, only King James is the real Bible. I know they told me that, but if they only knew that King James was translated from German. I speak several languages, so translating from one language to another language to another language, it's not the best way to translate. <laughs> so because of that, we have different versions. Now, which one is correct? I can't tell you because I pretty much use them all. I go to NIV. I go to Message. I even have a Bible that's written in Ebonics. I sure do because when I go talk to the, the people that that's how they speak, that's how I read it. I got to become all things to all people. So I'm using the Message Bible so it can be simple. First Samuel 3, verse 1. The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. This was a time when the revelation of God was rarely heard or seen. One night, Eli was sound asleep. His eyesight was very bad. He could hardly see. It was well before dawn. The sanctuary lamp was still burning. Samuel was still in bed in the temple of God where the chest of God rested. <laughs> I want you to kind of see this. Uh, this is the city that they were in was called Shiloh. Joshua set up the tabernacle in Shiloh. And that tabernacle stayed there for 369 years. You know, I thought of God and God counting. Because God gave a word to Samuel. See, in the beginning, this is the beginning part of God speaking to Samuel. And God is going to speak to Samuel at the fourth time is when Eli is going to say, okay, when you hear the voice again, tell him, Lord, speak, I'm listening. And he did that. I'm here, I'm listening. And God began to tell Samuel, little Samuel, he was most likely a kid by then, what I'm about to do, people are not going to even believe when they hear of it. I'm going to start with Eli and his sons. He, can you see this little Samuel is listening to God and God is telling little Samuel, I'm going to kill all these people you've been living with. How do you want to be the prophet that day? I, I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill his sons and I'm going to kill Eli too. I'm going to totally destroy their line. I, in Shiloh, 369 years that tabernacle stayed there. And people went there. And this is where Samuel was living. Right in that sanctuary area, right there with the Ark of the Covenant. But no one had heard from God for several years. See, we can think that God is in a box and we can bring the box, but the box is not speaking. Please, someone get it. Because, see, we go to church all the time to boxes. Come on, box, speak. At one time, yes, there was anointing in the house. At one time, there was a voice that was speaking. Right now, it's just silent. I'm going to the place where it once was, but I'm not finding anything. Well, why am I not finding anything? Because Eli and his sons are doing things that they shouldn't be doing in the house of God. See, you have many pastors they have find no problem sleeping with the sisters in church. Didn't we hear about fornication and adultery? I watched an interview of someone that said, oh, I was buffooned. He told me he was giving me anointing. And she was a high school teacher. What happened? Where did the mind just go? This is okay. See, they went to where there was once anointing, and they recognized the box. And in recognizing the box, they thought the anointing was in the box. And did not know that inside the box, there were things that were preserved for historical reasons to prove that God was once there. 
I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. Here it is, Eli. He wakes up in the morning and goes to Samuel. Samuel, tell me what God told you. Don't hold anything back from me. That to me is so strange. That, that's like me being the pastor of the church and going to little Elisha and Elisha, tell me what God said. Don't you hold back anything. See, we read it, but until we put ourselves in that situation, we don't understand how strange that is. Because Elijah, uh, Eli is supposed to be hearing. It's not supposed to be Elisha if we were to switch. Elisha is hearing from God and he's going to tell the pastor. So the pastor can get up and tell the audience what God has spoken. It's not supposed to be that way. So he goes and asks Samuel, tell me. And Samuel tells him everything. Now I want you to see Eli's conclusion. Verse 18, so Samuel told him word for word. He held back nothing. Eli said, it is God. Let him do whatever he thinks best. Our leadership has become so sorry that instead of us standing up and saying, you know what, I need to undo the stuff that I've done, we say, oh, well, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I am certain that Samuel told Eli all these things so Eli can do something. See, Eli has two sons, and his two sons were checking out the women at the, at the, the tabernacle, and they were, he was both of them sleeping around with, with the women. And the dad knew about it. The high priest knew about it. He didn't do anything. When they brought the sacrifice, they're supposed to get this little um, long pole with a hook at the end and stick the long pole with a hook and pull out, and whatever meat they get, that's what they were supposed to eat. They weren't doing that. They were taking the long pole with a hook and moving stuff around. Ooh, I like that one. That's what we're going to eat. They weren't relying on God. And Eli wasn't doing anything. So God began to do the count countdown. He says, you worship this box, so I'm going to take the box away from you. I'm going to take away from you what you thought was the holy thing. It wasn't the box. It was what was on the box, which is the presence of God. You ever gone to Walmart and the parents start to count to their kids? One, two, three. I really mean it this time. One, two, three. Boy, are you not listening to me? One. At the end of the first three, I want to be the parent and say, I'll take over. Don't worry. We're taking a walk to the bathroom. Why? Because they already counted to three, and I don't want to hear them count no more. <laughs> Says, you did the crime, now you got to pay the penalty. So God, God counted, because I found out 369 years is one, two, and three. Three goes into three, one time. Three goes into six, two times. Three goes into nine. Three times. After 369 years, the Ark of the Covenant was removed from Shiloh. It says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to remove and allow that Philistine folks to come in and take my glory. And when Eli found out, he died. Do we need to get to that point before the church gets up? Do we? Or are we recognizing the God of the box? Because see, I worship the God of the Ark of the Covenant. I don't worship the Ark of the Covenant. I do understand that you can't touch it because it's a holy thing, so I'm not touching it. But I recognize the power that's in the box has nothing to do with the box itself. It has to do with God. Because God allowed these Philistines uncircumcised to grab hold of this holy thing and carry it away. 
And they took it away and they put it right in their throne room of another God. I wonder what God was thinking of that day. We're going to put you with Dagon. Dagon. <laughs> Y'all got to read about that because every time I read about it, I start to laugh. I find it to be so crazy. And they're going to put God with another God and think there's not going to be a battle of the gods. You know, God loves to battle against other gods. Now, they're gods with small G's because God is, uh, you know, all capital. Because <laughs> all ten plagues that he hit Egypt representing a god of Egypt. Every single plague represented a god. Isn't that awesome? Say, I'm going to show off my power. No, I'm going to harden his heart. He's not going to let you go. Why? Because I'm going to show him. Mr. Frog, God, I'm going to bring all the frogs, and then I'm going to kill them. Mr. Nile, God, I'm going to turn your water to blood. Mr. Sun, God, who is supposed to be the largest of all gods in Egypt, Mr. Ra, I'm going to darken you out. <laughs> And they're going to put him with Dagon. And God knocked over Dagon. <sighs> I'm just playing. <laughs> Dagon broke. They come in the next day. Ooh, Dagon broke. Let's put them back together. They leave again. And God said, this time I'm going to make it to where they can't put them together. There's no Humpty Dumpty here. <laughs> just broken so many pieces. And then so religious, they say, ooh, Dagon broke, so let's not, let's not step on the, on the area where he broke at. Just from now on, he's not happy. That's what he broke. <laughs> he broke because God killed him. <laughs> Dagon is no God. God is calling us to a point to where we are going to do something instead of just sitting here and being, having a little pity party. Being all, oh, well, my mama fault. It's my daddy's fault. Yeah, I've seen psychologists and psychiatrists. I got an A on the subject. I understand what the stuff that they do. I don't agree with it. I don't. Because you need to be responsible for your own stuff you did. You know, when you're asking God for forgiveness, you're asking God for forgiveness of what you did, not what mama did. Not mama and them. They need to ask for forgiveness themselves. It's what you did. And you come before God, and this is what I'm responsible for, Lord. This is where I've messed up. And learn to be honest. We've been in church so long that we've learned how to play the, the hypocritical game. We know Christianese well. Hey, I grew up in church. I knew how to act it, too. Sit there and try to act like you're speaking in tongues, a whole bunch of Japanese words, Honda, Kawasaki, Mitsubishi. You know, and it's... We've learned the game, but it's time that we get real because our life that we're living is not a game. This is for real. I'm either going to make a difference for somebody or I'm going to get in the way of somebody. I'd rather make a difference. And I certainly don't want to be like Eli to where my kids are messing up and I'm like, oh, don't worry about it, y'all. Just pray for them. My kids can tell you they mess up. They got to deal with the speech. You think I'm long-winded when I preach? Who come to my house when I'm giving them the speech. They hate it. Go to the great room and wait for me. Uh, we're going to be there five hours. Five, six, seven, eight, until I get it all out of me. Because you're not going to keep on acting like this and think it's okay. You know, my son, he's 16. I don't whoop him no more. I guarantee you he has days so he probably say, I'd rather the whooping. <laughs> Just give me the whooping until I can get it over with. I'm gonna sit here and have to give up six hours of my life hearing the stories. <laughs> Why I I have to be responsible for my kids. If I'm a pastor, I can't just have my kids just doing whatever they want to do. I need to be able to say something. And especially if God were to humiliate me by sending a little kid and tell me this is what God said about you. 
Really, it's a humiliation, isn't it? Come on, adults. How would you like the smallest person in here to hear from God and come and tell you? I don't know why Eli wasn't humiliated. I don't know why. He's, okay, I really need to change. God, you speaking to this little boy. What about me? I've been here all my life right next to this Ark of the Covenant. Why aren't you speaking to me? Why are you speaking? What's so special about Samuel? I want you to kind of backtrack. Verse 4, then God called out, Samuel, Samuel. Answered, yes, I'm here. Then he ran to Eli saying, I heard you call. Here I am. Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And so he did. God called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went, Eli, I heard you call. Here I am again, Eli said. Son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This all happened before Samuel knew God for himself. It was before the revelation of God had been given to him personally. All right, I'm going to make it even worse. Here is someone that's prophesying to you who has never received Jesus as their own Savior because they themselves have not met him yet. And Eli was okay with that. See, some of you adults on the inside, aren't you getting a little ticked off? It's like, what in the world is happening? See, I do know this about Scripture. The Bible says if, if I would not praise him, he'll cause the rocks to cry out in my place. And I'm telling you, there are many rocks that are crying out right now. Because I stopped to consider what a rock is. A rock contains all the minerals that are required in life, but they don't have breath, so they are not alive. An unsaved person has everything that's required in life, but they don't have breath. They're not alive. And they're crying out in our place. And we are okay about it. We're okay. Hey, go ahead, Whoopi Goldberg. Go ahead and do your Sister Act 1 and Sister Act 2 and, and praise God for us. And we're just going to sit there and buy the ticket and enjoy the movie. I was angry. Because I'm my sheep was praising God better than I am. And I'm alive. And she's not. What happened if we were to act alive? There's something about a life that's interesting. It reproduces. The same bacteria that you got from your pool and looked at, look at it again, you'll see it multiplied. We come into the church and don't see a lot of reproduction. Why? Because we're not acting alive. Everything that's alive reproduces. So why are we reproducing? It's your job, Pastor. You're the one called to minister to people. No, I'm not. Who told you that? That's not in the Bible. It's not my job to get people saved. It's not. Whose job is it? Yours. I didn't go to your house and help you have your babies. You got with your husband and your wife, and you did, did, did that all by yourself. We have to do the same thing. When we're ministering to people, we are all called to minister. I don't know if you know this. You are all called to minister. All of you have something to say to somebody. But if they miss the opportunity because you kept your mouth, because I don't know what to say, just open your mouth. Just open it. Lord God, I really feel like I need to say something to this person, but I'm afraid. Huh, you're afraid. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but he has given unto you a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid I'm going to say the, the wrong thing. Well, it's going to be worse if you say nothing. Say the wrong thing. You can recover from saying the wrong thing. I know when I was dating my wife, I said a few wrong things, but I still end up marrying her. She forgave all the wrong things I said. She saw how I was trying. We need to do the same thing. Put some effort in there. I have my son, he's praying for someone in the school. And it's someone that gets on his nerves. And he's praying for him. And he said to me uh, yesterday, the day before, Dad, I finally figured it out. It's like, what? They have a really bad self-image. So they're always throwing it on everybody else because they feel bad about themselves. I said, great. 
And I keep being a light around her, and she can't stand it. I'll sit next to her, and she'll get up and leave. Keep trying. Keep trying. It may not be anytime soon. It may not be 10 years from now. It may not be 20 years. It may not be 30 years. But their time will come. So, Elijah, do you remember me? Um, remind me who you are. I was that girl that always treated you bad. Um, yeah, I kind of know who you are now. How can I help you? Well, I remember when you were in school that you were always different. And I remember you were into God and stuff. And can you help me? Can you be the different for someone that 20 years from now they can remember you? 30 years from now they can remember you? I have friends that pop up on Facebook. Ronaldo, I heard you're a pastor. I am. Can you pray for me? I'm attending JSU. The secretary of the music department pulled me out the hallway. Ronaldo, I need you over here. And I'm like really uncomfortable holding this woman's hand. Going into her office and, and get in there, I need you to pray for me. I need you to lay hands on me right here and, and agree with me. What made her think that I'm so unusual that she can do that? I didn't put any boundaries. I didn't say untouchable because I'm holy. I'm a pastor. I act just like everybody else. When the, those teenagers are sitting there saying jokes and they end up being a dirty joke and I don't laugh, oh, I'm so sorry. Be you. You're not going to change for God. Don't change for me. I'm okay. I'm not going to go home and think, oh, I can't believe he said that in front of me. I'm just a regular person. But 10 years from now, when God is tugging on them, that they can remember. You remember Ronaldo. You remember Jennifer. You remember Eliza. You remember Donna. You remember Shannon. Remember Darcy, Diana. Can you be that for someone? Can you be such a light right now that the light will still be shining in their minds 10 years from now? I really believe you can. I really believe you can be that testimony for someone that would draw them to Christ because they've read the Bible already and they're not convinced because they've seen the, the ones that call themselves a church. And I said it that way. They've seen the one that call themselves the church because the church is supposed to be love. God is love. So we are love. We're not critical. We're not backbiters. We're not slanders. We're not all the stuff you've seen in church. We're not that. Am I the only one that grew up in church? We're not that. We forgive easily. We let it go easily. I don't, I don't hear any amens in here. <laughs> it's like, what? We do what? Yes. How about if God should treat you like how you treat people? How, God, how about if God were to say, I'm not going to forgive you because you don't know how to forgive. By the way, that's in the Bible. Did you know that was in the Bible? So if you can't forgive, he's not forgiving you? How many of you are automatically, that's not right. I know part of me feels like that's not right, but God is always right. So I need to get to the point. To where I can be a living example. Now, living example hurts because I'm also a living sacrifice. And a sacrifice is always put in the fire. The problem with being a living sacrifice is I can decide to get up. The dead sacrifice is easy. You don't have a choice. Sit there and just burn. But being a living sacrifice, we feel the pain. We feel the heat. And every once in a while, we want to get up and say, I'm not willing to pay this cost. But our cost is nothing compared to the cost that God paid. Ours is nothing. 
I've read some scriptures in the Bible that are really odd, like he suffers all things yet without sin. I haven't suffered all things. You haven't suffered all things. Together combined, we haven't suffered all things. But Jesus did. And he didn't sin. He came here and gave his life for a ransom for me and for you. And all we are called to do is now live for him. That's what we're called to do. To live as Christ. To live for him. God told us, my wife and I, several years ago to give up what we had in Miami and move to Alabama. And I would love to have to tell you that we were so spiritually minded and love God so much that we say, yes, Lord. We will do it. But both of us said, no, we're not going nowhere. We're not leaving Miami for no Alabama. And then God took away the reason we were staying behind. Things. He took them all away one by one. When we had nothing left, Lord God, we'll go wherever you send us. Why is it we wait to lose everything before we pay attention? How about we pay attention without losing? How about we do what God tells us to do and we can still keep our nice house and our nice car and our nice furniture and our nice jobs? How about if we can just be obedient? See, now when we go back to Miami, my wife and I look at each other like, man, we can't stand being here for too long. We, I, her family still lives there. We go visit and can't wait to leave because we are not used to the, the highways being parking lots. I mean, sit there for four or five hours and you've only moved 30 feet. We're not used to that anymore. What we used to love, now we can't stand it. It gets on our nerves. So how did we change so much? We changed because we finally did what God called us to do. Amen. See, that other desire of what we wanted was pulled out of us. And we don't desire that no more. We don't even feel comfortable around it. Where's your home, Alabama? Oh, I have people that make fun. I come from Alabama with a banjo on my... Hey, Alabama is beautiful. But they talk all country over there. Yeah, they do. You speak with an accent too. <laughs> Every region has their little way of talking. Oh, well, they're very ignorant. They're, no, no, that's just what the news shows. Uh, some of you who've been to other places, you kind of understand. Every time there's something that happened in Alabama, they always find someone who's ignorant and put them on the news. Sure, the whole world think this is Alabama. <laughs> the one with no tooth and the, the, the snuff in his mouth and I don't know what happened. You know, that's not Alabama. We got really smart people here. Very gifted, very intelligent, very skilled. It's time the rest of the world understands. That we are called. God told me, he says, Ronaldo, you prayed when you were a little that you wanted to be where there was going to be the next powerful move of God. And I've moved you there. Alabama, yes. Lord, why Alabama? Because I always use the lease. I'm always, I love the underdog. I love the one that is marked off to lose so I can show it to the proud, so I can show it to the lofty and say, look what God has done. I used the foolish to confound, confound the wisdom of the wise. God is doing such a powerful move of God in this state that the rest of the United States is going to feel it, but we need to start and raise up. Get the attitude of God is using me. There is no sin with you getting up every morning and saying, God is going to use me today. There's no sin in that. Yeah, the enemy can tell you you're being boastful. No, you're not being boastful because you're saying God is going to do it. You're not being boastful. God's going to use me today. God is going to send someone today that I can speak a word to. And when God does, 
open up your mouth. You'll see that it'll be as a river. One time I, I went to Walmart, and of course everyone here knows Walmart. And I saw this lady way over there in the almost in the department where you buy the, the, the little birthday cards or whatever. And God said, go, go to her and speak to her. And see, when God gives a prophet a word, he doesn't tell him everything. He tells him one step. That's one step. I could have easily killed what God wanted to do because I don't know about that. I'm in Walmart. This is not even church. She may not even be Christian. She may not want to hear what I have to say. But I've learned enough because I lost a house, I lost a child, I lost jobs, I've lost money, I've, I've lost so much for being disobedient and not doing what God told me to do that I'm like, hey, Lord God, all you told me is to go over there and say something, open my mouth. So I just walked over and I said, excuse me, God has a word for you. And I would love to tell you that I knew that word, but I knew nothing. Why? Because prophets have to walk by faith, too. You got to walk by faith. I said, I have a word for you. And she looked at me. She says, you do? I want to hear it. And inside of my head, I'm like, I want to hear it, too. <laughs> and what I did next was just open my mouth and let God speak. And I took this woman to Walmart. Says, begin to look for a job. God has a new job for you. And I told her how much she was going to make in the new job. And I said, within a week, you're going to have that job. Oh, I received that word. And I walked out. I never thought I would see that woman again. What are the chances? Come on, total stranger. I'm at drive through at Burger King, paying for my stuff. Here comes a person from the back. And I'm already, oh, they're going to ask me for money because they always ask me for money. I don't know if I have a sign that said, ask me, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so I'm expecting this person to walk up and, uh, can I have $2 because I don't have enough for my food? And I was already taking out my wallet. I was already going to give her the money. She said, you don't know me. And I'm looking at her like, how much money you want? But you, a few months ago, you gave me a word at Walmart. And you told me to start looking for a job. And I was praying to God that he can give me a, a new job because I had been in that job for 14 something years and never got a raise. And you spoke that word and I went and looked for a job and I want you to know the very next day I got the job making what you said I was going to make. And then I just felt the anointing of God come over me and I said, because you've come and tell me this, God says he, you're going to get a promotion today. I ran into her like three years later at Head Start. What city is, what area that is? The Head Start where Jordan was going to, Adrian and Jordan. Hall Head Start. Go over there and I walk in the door and all these women surrounded me. Speak a word to me. Speak a word to me. Tell me what God's going to do. Speak a good word. Prophesy blessings upon me. What's wrong with y'all? It's, then the lady showed up he is the man I told you about he's the one that talked to me at Walmart he's the one that told me I was getting a promotion he is the one and I never got to tell him I got a promotion that very same day now they wanted me to prophesy I can't make something up you know, if I'm walking by faith by the word that is coming from God, I can't sit there and say, okay, yeah, you're going to get another job. And yeah, I, sorry, ladies, I have nothing for you. And I walked out because he's an amen. He's not in a box. <laughs> but I guarantee you this, if God did give me a word all of a sudden and I run into one of these ladies, they're willing to hear it. You can be a light for someone Every single day, every day, be a light for someone. Because the Bible says this, a candle that's set up on a hill can be hid. You can't hide what's inside of you. You can try, 
but it's not working. You've seen enough hypocrisy to know the difference. Now you be the real. I can't go to church. They're full of hypocrites. Yes, I've been one. You've been one. We've all been one. But it's time that we become real. A relationship with Jesus is not this fanciful thing. Oh, I just pray whenever I want to. And No, it's a relationship. It's just like me and my wife have a relationship together. I have a relationship with the living God. And every once in a while, I need the living God to tell me I love you. Every once in a while, to, it will be okay. Every once in a while, I got this. Every once in a while, I need to hear a word from God. The bad part about being a prophet is you prophesy to a lot of people, but not many come and prophesy to you. Always giving a word to someone, but rarely ever receiving a word. And I've had to learn. Seek God for your own self. Stop trying to hear a word from someone else. Hear from God himself. He wants to speak to you right where you are. He wants you to know I'm part of your life right now. If you have some issues in your life that you need to deal with, just take a moment and begin to deal with it. We all know how to do that. Just take a moment and follow this and that and this and the other and then the next. And I want that when you leave this place, you leave that stuff. That you don't pick it back up. Just leave it. Because if it's hindering your walk, the Bible says this, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. I'm not telling you to pull your eye out. I'm telling you to take the junk that you have that you're dealing with that is messing you up to pull it out of you. And when you leave this place today, you leave it there. Don't you come back over here trying to pick it back up again. You leave it here. It's all right. We got some heavenly vacuum cleaners. We'll suck that stuff out and get rid of it. Because God is doing something that we require to be bold. And when the enemy has stuff against you that he can throw at your, at your face, you lose your boldness. Get to where you can be bold again. To where the enemy, I know what you did yesterday, yes, but you did not know what I did today. What did you do? I became new again. What do you mean you got, became new again? I repented again. And I am new again. And God can't remember what you're talking about, so you're talking to the wrong person. Let's get new again. Because you want new anointing, new levels comes with new devils. Please understand that. You want a higher anointing, you're going to have a, a tougher uh, cycle to go through. I want a, a higher anointing. I know some of you do too. But new levels comes with new devils. And we need to plow them out of the field. Just knock them out one by one. I want not only this church, but many other churches who are preaching the same type of things to rise up in this city. To rise up. Look around you. This is not normal for Alabama, is it? It isn't. It's not the norm for Alabama. But this is going to be the norm for our state. It's going to be normal where we're no longer going to be looking at the boundaries that have so kept us. We're going to recognize people by the spirit and no longer by the flesh. We're going to know who to, to be able to grab hold. I need you to intercede with me about this right now. You don't care what color they are. Just come on. I know the anointing. It's on you and in you and intercede with me. Because what God is doing in the city cannot be stopped. So we were kind of really, really quiet, so I'm going to finish right there. 